This is the third video in topic four, which is what decides how fast a river flows. In this video, we're going to be considering ideal fluid flow, the Bernoulli equation, viscosity, and turbulence. In the last video, we were considering the pressure in large stationary bodies of water. In this video, we're going to be considering what happens when the water starts to move, as it does in a river. So we're going to be considering fluid flows. We're going to start by considering ideal fluid flow, and then we'll look at some turbulence and viscosity, which is less ideal fluid flow, but happens in real life. So first of all, let's define what we mean by ideal fluid flow, and then we'll look at a couple of equations that describe ideal fluid flow. So ideal fluid flow is the flow of fluids which is steady or laminar. So a steady flow means that each of the little increments through that flow is moving with the same speed or velocity. So it doesn't matter if you're at the top of the fluid, or you're at the bottom of the fluid, or where you are in the river. If it's ideal fluid flow, you've got the same speed at each of those points. And this is also called laminar flow. The second thing we need to have ideal fluid flow is irritational flow. So this means that if we put a paddle wheel at any point in that flow, it doesn't spin. So the force on the right of the paddle wheel is the same as the force on the left of the paddle wheel. So whirlpools and things like that would mean that we had non-irritational flow. And so we're assuming that we don't have whirlpools and things in our ideal fluid flow. The other thing we need for ideal fluid flow is a non-viscous liquid. So water is fairly non-viscous. It's not very sticky, it flows quite fast, and so this is non-viscous. Later, we'll be looking in more details about what viscose is. Honey is a very viscous fluid, for example. And finally, the fluid that we're considering needs to be incompressible. So if we try and squash water, it's really, really hard. It's very hard to change the volume of the water by applying pressure. Air, on the other hand, is easy to compress, and so air is not incompressible. So we're going to make those assumptions about our ideal fluid. So let's start by considering water moving along a hose. Now, what do we know about water moving along a hose? Well, one thing we know is that any water we put in at this end has to come out at this end eventually. So the water we put in here each minute comes out here each minute. If that didn't happen, we'd have a big buildup of water in the hose, or we'd have extra water coming out the end, so we'd be magically creating water somehow in the hose, and that doesn't happen. So we know that the volume in per unit time is equal to the volume out per unit time. Now imagine what would happen to our hose if we had a really wide end here and a narrow end down here. Would it still be true that the volume we put in, in one minute here, comes out in one minute there? Well, yes, it would be, because otherwise, once again, we'd be creating or destroying water within our hose, and as the hose doesn't have magical properties, that couldn't happen. So this actually leads us to an equation to describe fluid flow. So we've got the volume in per unit time is equal to the volume out per unit time. Now the volume flowing through a piece of pipe is equal to the length of the pipe times the surface area of the pipe. That's just a mathematical equation for the volume of a prism. So if we have that volume flowing in that unit time, we can write the surface area times the length of the pipe on time has to be constant because the volume in is the same as the volume out. So we can write this as the surface area times the length over the time is constant. Now the length that that water flows through over the time is actually just the speed of the water through the pipe. Because speed, as we'll look at in later videos, is just the distance travelled over the time. 
So we're going to give that the symbol V, V for speed because speed is very similar to velocity. In later videos we'll be looking at exactly what the difference is, it's just really that velocity has a direction as well as a magnitude, whereas speed just has a magnitude. So we're going to give that speed the symbol V. So the length travelled over the time is equal to V. And so we can write our equation as the surface area times the velocity is constant. So this gives us the equation A1 V1 is equal to A2 V2. So if we have a wide end of the pipe, then this has a very large surface area and a narrow end of the pipe has a very small cross-sectional surface area and so the velocity must be much greater through the narrow pipe than through the wide pipe. So if you're cleaning your car and you want to get water coming out of the hose with a high speed, then you tend to put your finger over the nozzle of the hose and block off some of that cross-sectional surface area of your hose. And so when you do that, decreases the cross-sectional area and increases the speed of the water coming out, which means that it can hit the car with a lot more force. When it, when it stops, it has a lot more force and that helps to dislodge the dirt from your car. Let's solve a problem using this equation now. 7,600 gigalitres per year needs to flow through the Murray-Darling system to maintain its health. At one point along its path, the Murray has a width of 20 metres and a depth of 5 metres. We are going to assume that all the water in the system flows through this point. What average speed is needed at this point? And what speed is needed in a floodplain with a cross-sectional area of 1,000 metres squared? Okay, so we know that the volume over the time which is needed is we've got 7,600 gigalitres. So that's 7,600 times 10 to the 9 litres. And we want to get this into SI units. So we'll convert it into metres cubed. So if we times it by 10 to the minus 3, that gets us from litres to metres cubed and then we need per unit time. At the moment this is per year. So in a year there's 365 days, in a day there is 24 hours, in an hour there's 60 minutes and then in a minute there's 60 seconds. So this is going to give us the flow rate in metres cubed per second. So entering this into the calculator we get 241 metres cubed per second is the flow rate. So we know that this flow rate is constant because we've got A1V1 is equal to A2V2 and this flow rate AV is just equal to the volume of the water over the time. And so we know that at this point it's got a width of 20 metres and a depth of 5 metres. So there's 20 metres, here's 5 metres. So the cross-sectional area A is equal to 20 times 5 and so that's equal to 100 metres squared. And so we can get the speed, we've got AV is equal to 241 and A is 100 times the speed and so the speed is equal to 2.41 and that's in metres per second. So that is a fairly fast speed for a river to flow as we would expect if all the, riv all the water in the Murray-Darling was concentrated into such a small area. So then it asks us how fast would it flow if it went into a floodplain with an area of 1000 metres squared so that would be a very small floodplain. So that's just the cross-sectional area that could be, say, a kilometre wide and a metre deep. Is one possible configuration. But in that case, we just use again AV, the cross-sectional area times the speed is equal to 241. But in this case, A is 1,000. So we've got 241 is equal to 1,000 
times v and so the speed in this case is equal to 0 0.241 meters per second so much slower flowing which is why rivers slow down when they come to a floodplain. Now another important rule that describes ideal fluid flow is called Bernoulli's equation. It's named after the man who discovered it. So Bernoulli's equation tells us that the pressure plus half the density times the velocity squared plus the density times the acceleration due to gravity times the height is equal to a constant. Now Bernoulli's equation essentially comes about because of the conservation of energy in a fluid. I'm not going to derive this equation in this video, but if you are interested, there is a video which you can link to below on the Moodle page where this equation is derived. So there's some interesting things that Bernoulli's equation tells us about. In the next video, we're going to look at what it tells us about giraffes. But here, let's consider if we had, like we had before, a wide pipe going into a narrow pipe. Now, to keep it simple, we'll say that these pipes are at the same height. So we can ignore that height term in Bernoulli's equation. And so we've got that the pressure plus a half the density times the velocity squared is constant. Okay, so we start off in the wide pipe. In, as we go from the wide pipe to the narrow pipe, the cross-sectional area A decreases. Now, we've just seen that A1 times V1, the velocity in part one of the pipe, is equal to the cross-sectional area in the second part of the pipe, A2, times V2. So as A decreases, V has to increase. So in the narrow pipe, the velocity is much faster than in the wide part of the pipe. And now what Bernoulli's equation tells us is that therefore the pressure in the narrow part of the pipe must be lower than in the wide part of the pipe. Let's have a look at a demonstration now to see if this really works. What we have here is a demonstration showing Bernoulli's principle. So in a minute, we'll turn on the tap here, which will cause water to flow in from this end. Now here, we have the wide pipe. So the wide pipe has the large cross-sectional area, and so the smaller velocity flowing through. And so if it's got a smaller velocity, it needs to have a higher pressure to make up for that. In the middle here, we've got a narrower pipe, so a much smaller cross-sectional area. And so we have the water flowing more quickly through here, and so we should end up with the lower pressure. And then let's see what happens to the end one here, where the cross-sectional area of the pipe is the same as at the beginning. Let's turn on the tap now. So you can see at this end, the little bottle rises to quite a high height, indicating that we've got more pressure at this end. Then we, when we go through the narrow part, this bottle rises to a lower height, showing that we've got a lower pressure in the middle here. Now, according to Bernoulli's equation, because we have the same cross-sectional area here as here, and the height is the same, the pressures here and here should be equal. So can you think, what is going wrong? Why are these two heights not the same? Okay, the reason actually comes about because if you watched how we derived Bernoulli's equation, which was optional, you saw that it came about because of the conservation of energy. Now, this fluid flow is actually losing energy as we're going from here to here because there is friction between the walls of the glass and the fluid flowing through them. So Bernoulli's equation isn't quite perfect for this system as we do have energy lost due to that friction. And so the pressure at this end is slightly lower than the pressure at this end.
Now, in the hot air balloon topic, we saw that when we dropped objects on Earth, they actually fell a little bit slower than we expected due to air resistance. Now, in liquids, we have what's called a viscosity, and this is a very similar effect to air resistance. Very viscous fluids have a lot of friction in them, which works to stop them moving. So if we have a viscous fluid flowing through a pipe, at the edges of the pipe, which is stationary, the fluid flows very slowly because there's lots of friction there trying to stop it flow. As we get closer and closer to the center of the pipe, instead of being next to the pipe, which is absolutely stationary, the fluid in the middle is next to other fluid, which is flowing slowly. And so the fluid in the middle actually flows a little bit faster than the fluids on the outside. So this is caused by the viscosity or the internal friction of the fluid. So what we're going to look at now is a demonstration showing the different viscosity of two fluids. Here in this measuring cylinder, we've got water. In this measuring cylinder, we've got glycerol, which is a much more viscous fluid. And so as the viscosity is an internal friction, we'd expect bores to drop much more slowly through the more viscous fluid than through the less viscous fluid. So let's have a look now at what happens when I drop these bores at the same time into these two fluids. You can see the one in the water fell, might hit the bottom of the flask earlier than the one in the glycerol. As they went down, they took some trapped air with them and you can see that in the water, the bubbles also travelled much more quickly to the top of the water than happened in the glycerol. So what I've got here is a magnet. So because these are made from steel, these ball bearings, the magnet can be used to get the ball out of the liquid. So glycerol's rather slimy. So let's have another look at that. So viscosity of a fluid actually depends a bit on the temperature of the fluid. So you'd be aware of this if you've ever tried heating up honey or cooking oil. As the cooking oil or honey gets hotter, it's much easier to pour it. It flows much more smoothly and this is because the viscosity is decreasing. So viscosity is given the symbol, the Greek letter eta. So that looks like a curly N eta for viscosity. So the other thing which gets in the way of ideal fluid flow is turbulence. Most fluids become turbulent at a critical velocity. So Osmond Reynold, who lived from 1842 to 1912, was the first one who did a quantitative study of the onset of turbulence. And what he found was that it wasn't just dependent upon the velocity of the fluid, it also depended on the viscosity, the density, and the diameter of the pipe through which the fluid was flowing. So turbulence happens when we start to get whirlpools and things in the liquid. So when a liquid's flowing nice and smoothly, then there's no turbulence and this is called laminar flow and every particle making up that fluid is flowing at the same velocity. Now when we get turbulence, there's a bit of random motion imposed on top of this. So the average velocity 
of the particles in the fluid is the same, but some of the particles might get a little bit of a speed or a velocity to the left and some a little bit to the right. Some might go backwards for a small time and some might go forwards extra fast. So the average speed of all those particles is the same, but each of the individual particles making up the fluid has its own slightly different velocity. So we can see the onset of turbulence when we turn on a tap. So let's just have a quick look at that now. Now if we turn on a tap gently to start with, you can see initially we've got this laminar flow because there's no bubbles or anything in this fluid flow here. All the particles making up the water are moving downwards with the same velocity. Now if we turn up the amount of fluid flow, you can see that we begin to get turbulent flow. Some of these water molecules are moving a bit to the left, some are moving a bit to the right. On average they're all moving downwards, but this is turbulent flow. So Osmond Reynolds managed to describe this quantitatively. He came up with an equation. The Reynolds number is equal to the density of the fluid times the average velocity of the particles in the fluid times the diameter of the pipe divided by the viscosity. So if a Reynolds number is lower than 2300, then we have a nice laminar flow. So this was what happened when we just turned on that tap and the liquid was flowing out slowly. As we increase the Reynolds number by turning on the tap a little bit more and increasing the velocity a bit. The Reynolds, when the Reynolds number hits 2300, we start to get a mixture of laminar or steady flow, ideal fluid flow and turbulence. And then when the Reynolds number gets up above 4000, we've got completely turbulent flow and we can't really apply our equations for ideal fluid flow anymore. So turbulence happens in rivers when they get narrow, they start flowing very quickly and we see whirlpools and things develop inside the fluid. In a minute we'll solve a problem with the Reynolds number. But first let's just consider dimensions a bit because we haven't mentioned the dimensions for viscosity yet. Now Reynolds number is actually dimensionless. Okay, so Reynolds number is given by the density times the velocity times the diameter over the viscosity. So let's show that this is dimensionless and in showing this we'll show the units for the viscosity. So rho is equal to the density of the fluid. So the density of the fluid is measured in kilograms per meter cubed. V is the velocity or speed, which as we'll see later has the units of meters per second. D is the diameter, and the SI units for diameter is it's a length, so it's measured in meters. Now viscosity has units of Pascal seconds. Now we can actually simplify these units a bit further because we know that Pascals is the units for pressure and pressure is equal to force over area. Now force as we'll see in later videos is actually equal to the mass times the acceleration and this is over area. So the SI units for mass are kilograms the SI units for acceleration are meters per second per second, so that's ms to the minus 2, and the units for area are meters squared. So we can cancel this meter with this meter, and so we've got kilograms over meters second squared, moving this s to the minus 2 and writing it as s squared on the bottom. So Pascal seconds. Pascals are kilograms over meters second squared, and this is times seconds here. So that cancels, and we end up with kilograms over meter seconds. 
is the units for viscosity. Okay, so now we're going to work out what the units for Reynolds number are, and hope, hopefully we'll be showing that these are in fact dimensionless. So the units for Reynolds number. So density, that's kilograms over meters cubed. The units for velocity are meters over seconds. The units for diameter, that's meters. And now we have to divide by the viscosity. So we times it by the inverse of this. So this is meters seconds over kilograms. And now let's cancel out all our common factors. So there's kilograms here and there's kilograms here. There's meters cubed and there's one, two, three meters on the top. So these ones all cancel. Seconds on the top and seconds on the bottom. So this tells us that they all cancel out. And so hence, um, the Reynolds number is dimensionless. And in proving this, we've assumed that the units for viscosity is Pascal seconds, or alternatively, we can write it as kilograms divided by meter seconds. Okay, let's solve a problem now. So the question, what is the minimum speed of water from a tap with a diameter of 7.00 millimetres for which the flow can be considered turbulent? We're told that for water at 20 degrees C, the viscosity is 1.002 times 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds and the density is 998.2 kilograms per metres cubed. Now, to answer this, we're going to need to use Reynolds number. Reynolds number is given by the density times the velocity times the diameter over the viscosity. And we know that for turbulent flow, we need a Reynolds number of 4,000 or above. And what we're trying to find in this case is the velocity. So let's rearrange this equation to make the velocity the subject. So we've got that the velocity is equal to Reynolds number times the viscosity divided by the density on the diameter. Okay, so now we can substitute everything in. The minimum number that the Reynolds number can be is 4,000. And we're trying to get the minimum velocity, so we'll need to use that minimum number. So the viscosity is 1.002 times 10 to the minus 3. The density is 998.2 and the diameter is 7 millimetres, which we can put as 7.00 times 10 to the minus 3. So that 10 to the minus 3 and that 10 to the minus 3 will cancel each other out. And we end up with, when we type all this into the calculator, we get 0 0.574 metres per second. So it's when the water hits this velocity that the flow will be completely turbulent when it's coming out of the tap. Special thanks to Sebastian Frick for help with filming this film.